years, warfarin will be gone. But these drugs are going to be very expensive. And if you can identify genetically who can take warfarin, who metabolizes it normally, then who absorbs it normally, then everybody doesn't have to get the expensive drug, only those that have this problem. Heart failure. Um, so here's a nerve ending, and here's a cardiac cell, a myocyte. Norepinephrine is stored in these vesicles, and these yellow balls represent norepinephrine, which stimulate the heart. And there are variants to the receptors. The receptors that take up norepinephrine once it's released, and then how the heart responds to norepinephrine. So there are two different receptor variants. And lo and behold, here are the results of a clinical trial that showed if you have this beta-1 ARG389 abnormality, the effects of treating with a beta blocker was a 34% reduction in mortality. If you didn't have that, if you had the, the glycine form, there was no effect of the drug. So this is what I consider to be smart therapy. I'm going to go on uh, and um, uh, talk to you about uh, um, what I consider to be one of the really extraordinary papers of the 21st century. This comes from a group in, um, at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. And uh, they uh, studied a, uh, a genetic variation of a gene called PCSK9. And what that gene does, it reduces very modestly the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. And what they observed, and this is what I find so incredible, as well as others, you don't have to be um, a... Uh, rocket scientists to know this is a huge discovery. So if the variant was absent, which is in the majority of patients, in a Dallas population study, normal people in Dallas, the LDL was 138, which is too high. We all know that. This is a, a group of subjects who had um, uh, who had very poor diet, and they were high-risk people, but they were the general subjects. And their LDL was 138. If they had the variant, the LDL was 100. So that's not a huge change. We get that with statin drugs all the time. So there was a 28% reduction. But there was an 89% reduction in coronary disease. So how could this be? We know that we can, with ordinary statin drugs that probably a quarter of the people in this room are taking, uh, we can get a bigger reduction than 28%. But when most of us started to take statins, we were in middle age or beyond. And these patients started out with a 28% lower LDL. So that certainly suggests that maybe we should be beginning this therapy much earlier in life. Um, I also want to say something that's really futuristic, uh, and that has to do with gene therapy, and that's inserting a gene into a cardiac cell. Now this has had a checkered history. It has had a checkered history because some of the early experiments went bad. And one normal subject at the <laughs> University of Pennsylvania tragically succumbed from gene therapy. And um, so it went on hold. A lot of these small startup companies went out of business. But now it's picking up again. And there are three viruses. AAV, adeno-associated virus, which is shown here in these blue things, lentivirus and adenovirus. These 
can carry the gene into the cell and ultimately carry the gene into the nucleus of the cell and replace the faulty gene. Dr. Raja Hajar, who is a um, uh, professor at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, has begun clinical trials now. Sad to say, he's doing those trials in London. Uh, and that's a story in itself. But I think that this is going to become a very important part of our future. So just to summarize then, the near future, I would say, is 2009 to 2020. And we will have increased interventions in these next 10 years. That means more intervention, means more pacemakers put in place, more cardiac surgery, more things that you do to a patient where somebody's hands and a device go into a patient. And um, uh, because they're very useful. And we know there are more and more people with coronary disease. And then uh, the scale shows prevention on the other side, but it's not as high. Now, when some of this genetic information becomes more widespread, and I just give you a few examples, and I think that tipping point, I would predict, will be in about 10 years. And at that point, there will still be interventions, but there'll be less, and prevention is going to rule the day. And I would hope that the principal role of the cardiologist, which today is to recognize and manage established disease, by 2020, will interpret and apply genetic information in prevention and in treatment. And the goal for everyone is to eliminate serious cardiovascular disease as a threat to life and to health worldwide. Thank you so much for your invitation to come here. And again, my warmest wishes for your future careers in medicine.